The Story of Civilization, Volume 6, The Reformation, by Will Durant. Part 3, Continued, Cassette 4, Side 2. Mining, metallurgy, and textiles received most of the mechanical improvements credited to this age. The earliest railways were those on which miners pulled or pushed or carrying carts. In 1533, Johann Jürgen added to the spinning wheel, hitherto spun by hand, a treadle that spun it by foot, leaving the hands of the weaver free. Production soon doubled. Watches were improved in reliability while diminishing in size. They were engraved, chased, enameled, bejeweled. Henry VIII wore a tiny one that had to be wound only every week. However, the best watches of this period erred by some fifteen minutes per day. Communication and transport limped behind commerce and industry. Postal service was gradually extended to private correspondence during the sixteenth century. The commercial revolution stimulated improvements in shipbuilding. Deeper and thinner keels helped stability and speed. Masts increased from one to three, sails to five or six. Francis I and Henry VIII ran a race not only in war and love and dress, but in shipping. Each had a grandiose vessel built to order and whim, crowded with superstructure, and flaunting the pennants of their pride. In the Mediterranean, a ship of the early sixteenth century could make ten miles an hour in fair weather, but the heavier vessels designed for the Atlantic were lucky to make one hundred twenty-five miles a day. On land, the fastest travel was by the postal courier, who rode some eighty-five miles a day. Yet important news usually took ten or eleven days to get from Venice to Paris or Madrid. Probably no one then appreciated the comfort of having news arrive too late for action. Land travel was mostly on horseback, hence the heavy iron tethering ring fastened to the entrance door of a house. Coaches were multiplying, but the roads were too soft for wheeled traffic. Coaches had to be equipped with six or more horses to drag them through the inevitable mud, and they could not expect to cover more than twenty miles a day. Litters carried by servants were still used by ladies of means, but simple people traveled on foot across the continent. Traveling was popular despite roads and inns. Erasmus thought the inns of France were tolerable, chiefly because the young waitresses giggle and play wanton tricks, and when you go away embrace you, and all for so small a price. But he denounced German innkeepers as ill-mannered, ill-tempered, dilatory, and dirty. When you have taken care of your horse, you come into the stove room, boots, baggage, mud, and all, for that is a common room for all comers. In the stove room, you pull off your boots, put on your shoes, and, if you will, change your shirt. There, one combs his head, another belches garlic, and there is as great a confusion of tongues as at the building of the Tower of Babel. In my opinion, nothing is more dangerous than for so many to draw in the same vapor, especially when their bodies are opened with the heat, not to mention the farting, the stinking breaths, and without doubt many have the Spanish, or as it is called, the French pox, though it is common to all nations. If matters were really so in some inns, we can forgive a sin or two to the traveling merchants who put up at and with them in the process of binding village with village, nation with nation, in an ever-spreading economic web. In each decade, some new trade route was opened, overland as by Chancellor in Russia, overseas as by a thousand adventurous voyages. Shakespeare's Shylock trafficked with England, Lisbon, Tripoli, Egypt, India, and Mexico. Genoa had trading colonies in the Black Sea, Armenia, Syria, Palestine, and Spain. It made its peace with the port and sold arms to the Turks who were at war with Christendom. France saw the point, made her own entente with the sultans, and after 1560 dominated Mediterranean trade. Antwerp received goods every whence, and shipped them everywhere. To meet the needs of this expanding economy, the bankers improved their services and techniques. As the cost of war rose with the change from feudal levies, bringing their own bows and arrows, pikes and swords, to masses of militia or mercenaries equipped with firearms and artillery and paid by the state, the governments borrowed unprecedented sums from the bankers, and the interest they paid or failed to pay made or broke financial firms. The savings of the people were lent at interest to bankers, who wherewith financed expensive undertakings in commerce and industry. Notes of exchange replaced cumbersome transfers of currency or goods. Rates of interest varied not with the greed of the lender so much as with the reliability of the borrower. So the free cities of Germany, controlled by merchants prompt in payments, could borrow at five percent, but Francis I paid ten and Charles V twenty. Rates declined as economies were stabilized. 
Gold and silver from the mines of Germany, Hungary, Spain, Mexico, and Peru provided an abundant and fluid currency. The new supplies of precious metal came just in time, for goods had been multiplying faster than coin. Imports from Asia were paid for only partly by exports, partly by gold or silver. Hence, in the decades before Columbus, prices fell to the discouragement of enterprise and trade. After the development of European mines and the import of silver and gold from Africa and America, the supply of precious metal outran the production of goods. Prices rose, business rejoiced. An economy based on mobile money dislodged the old economy rooted in the holding of land or the control of industry by the guilds. Guilds were in decay. They had taken form in times of municipal autarky and protectionism. They were not organized either to raise capital or to buy wholesale from distant sources, or to use factory methods and the division of labor, or to reach distant markets with their products. From the 13th century onward, they had developed an aristocratic exclusiveness and had made conditions so hard for the journeyman as to drive him into the arms of the capitalist employer. The capitalist was animated by the profit motive, but he knew how to gather savings into capital, how and where to buy machinery and raw materials, run mines, build factories, recruit workers, divide and specialize labor, open and reach foreign markets, finance elections, and control governments. The new supplies of gold and silver cried out for profitable investment. American gold became European capital. In the resultant capitalism, there was a zest of competition, a stimulus to enterprise, a feverish search for more economical ways of production and distribution, which inevitably left behind the self-contentment of guildsmen plodding in ancient grooves. The new system surpassed the old in the quantity, not in the quality of its product, and merchants were crying out for quantity production to pay with manufactured exports for their imports from the East. The new wealth was largely confined to the merchants, financiers, manufacturers, and their allies in government. Some nobles still made fortunes through vast holdings with hundreds of tenants, or through enclosures that supplied wool to the textile industry. But for the most part, the landowning aristocracy found itself squeezed between kings and business-controlled cities. It declined in political power and had to content itself with pedigrees. The proletariat shared with the nobility the penalties of inflation. From 1500 to 1600, the price of wheat, with which the poor baked their bread, rose 150% in England, 200% in France, 300% in Germany. Eggs had been four pence for ten dozen in England in 1300. In 1400, the same quantity cost five pence. In 1500, seven pence. And in 1570, forty-two pence. Wages rose, but more slowly, since they were regulated by government. In England, the law, in 1563, fixed the annual wage of a hired farmer at twelve dollars, of a farmhand at nine dollars fifty cents, of a manservant at $7.25. Allowing the purchasing power of these sums to have been 25 times greater in 1563 than in 1954, they come to $180 or so per year. We should note, however, that in all these cases, bed and board were added to the wage. By and large, the economic changes of the 16th century left the working classes relatively poorer and politically weaker than before. Workers produced the goods that were exported to pay for imported luxuries that brightened and softened the lives of a few. The war of the classes took on a bitterness hardly known since the days of Spartacus in Rome. Let the revolt of the Comuneros in Spain, the Peasants' War in Germany, Ket's Rebellion in England, serve as evidence. Strikes were numerous, but they were suppressed by a coalition of employers and government. In 1538, the English Cloth Workers Guild, controlled by the masters, decreed that a journeyman who refused to work under the conditions laid down by the employer should be imprisoned for the first offense, whipped and branded for the second. The laws of vagrancy under Henry VIII and Edward VI were so savage that few workers dared to be found unemployed. A law of 1547 enacted that an able-bodied person leaving his work and roaming the country as a vagrant should be branded on the breast with the letter V, and be given as a slave for two years to some citizen of the neighborhood, to be fed on bread and water and small drink, and refuse of meat, and if the vagrancy was repeated, the offender was to be branded on cheek or forehead with the letter S, and be condemned to slavery for life. It is to the credit of the English nation that these measures could not be enforced, and had soon to be repealed, 
but they display the temper of 16th century governments. Duke George of Saxony decreed that the wages of miners under his jurisdiction should not be raised, that no miner should leave one place to seek work in another, and that no employer should hire anyone who had fomented discontent in another mine. Child labor was sanctioned, explicitly or implicitly, by law. The lace-making industry in Flanders was entirely worked by children, and the law forbade any girl over twelve years of age to engage in that occupation. Laws against monopolies, corners, or usury were evaded or ignored. The Reformation fell in with the new economy. The Catholic Church was by temperament antipathetic to business. It had condemned interest, had given religious sanction to guilds, had sanctified poverty and castigated wealth, and had freed workers from toil on holy days so numerous that in 1550 there were in Catholic countries 115 non-working days in the year. This may have played a part in the slower industrialization and enrichment of Catholic lands. Theologians approved by the Church had defended the fixing of just prices by law for the necessaries of life. Thomas Aquinas had branded as sinful covetousness the pursuit of money beyond one's needs, and had ruled that any surplus possessions were due by natural law to the purpose of succoring the poor. Luther had shared these views. But the general development of Protestantism unconsciously cooperated with the capitalist revolution. Saints' holy days were abolished, with the resultant increase in labor and capital. The new religion found support from businessmen and returned the courtesy. Wealth was honored, thrift was lauded, work was encouraged as a virtue, interest was accepted as a legitimate reward for risking one's savings. 2. Law It was a cruel age, and its laws corresponded to a pitiless economy, a shameful pauperism, a somber art, and a theology whose God had repudiated Christ. Among populations mostly fated to poverty here and damnation hereafter, crime was natural. Murder was plentiful in all classes. Every man of caliber dangled a dagger, and only the weakling relied on the law to redress his wrongs. Crimes of passion were as frequent in life as in Shakespeare, and any Othello who failed to slay his suspected wife was rated less than a man. Travelers took highwaymen for granted and proceeded in groups. In the cities, still unlit at night, robbers were as plentiful as prostitutes, and the man's home had to be his castle. In the heyday of Francis I, a gang of thieves called Mauvais Garçons despoiled Paris in full sunlight. Brantome tells us, as unreliably as usual, how Charles the Ninth, wishing to learn how the cutpurses performed their arts, instructed his police to invite ten such artists to a royal ball. After the ball was over, he asked to see their spoils. The money, jewelry, and garments unostentatiously acquired by them during the evening amounted to many thousands of dollars' worth, at which the king thought he would die of laughter. He allowed them to keep the fruit of their studies, but had them enrolled in the army as better dead than alive. If we classify as crimes the adulteration of goods, the chicanery of business frauds, the bribery of courts, the seizure of ecclesiastical property, the extension of frontiers by conquest, every second man in Europe was a thief. We may give some the benefit of clergy and allow for an honest craftsman here and there. Add a little arson, a little rape, a little treason, and we begin to understand the problems faced by the forces of order and law. These were organized to punish rather than to prevent crime. In some large towns, like Paris, soldiers served as guardians of the peace. City blocks had their wardens, parishes their constables, but by and large the cities were poorly policed. Statesmen weary of fighting the nature of man reckoned it cheaper to control crime by decreeing ferocious penalties and letting the public witness executions. A score of offenses were capital, murder, treason, heresy, sacrilege, witchcraft, robbery, forgery, counterfeiting, smuggling, arson, perjury, adultery, rape, unless healed by marriage, homosexual actions, bestiality, falsifying weights or measures, adulterating food, damaging property at night, escaping from prison, and failure in attempted suicide. Execution might be by relatively painless beheading, but this was usually a privilege of ladies and gentlemen. Lesser fry were hanged, heretics and husband killers were burned, outstanding murderers were drawn and quartered, and a law of Henry VIII, in 1531, punished poisoners by boiling them alive, as we gentler souls do with shellfish. A Salzburg municipal ordinance required that a forger shall be burned or boiled to death, a perjurer shall have his tongue torn out by the neck, 
A servant who sleeps with his master's wife, daughter, or sister shall be beheaded or hanged. Julienne Rabot, who had killed her child after a very painful delivery, was burned at Angers in 1531. And there, too, if we may believe Baudin, several persons were burned alive for eating meat on Friday and refusing to repent. Those who repented were merely hanged. Usually the corpse of the hanged was left suspended as a warning to the living, until the crows had eaten the flesh away. For minor offenses, a man or a woman might be scourged, or lose a hand, a foot, an ear, a nose, or be blinded in one eye or both, or be branded with a hot iron. Still milder misdemeanors were punished by imprisonment in conditions varying from courtesy to filth, or by the stocks, the pillory, the whipping cart, or the docking stool. Imprisonment for debt was common throughout Europe. All in all, the penal code of the sixteenth century was more severe than in the Middle Ages, and reflected the moral disorder of the time. The people did not resent these ferocious punishments. They took some pleasure in attending executions, and sometimes lent a helping hand. When Montecuculli confessed, under torture, that he had poisoned, or had intended to poison, Francis, the beloved and popular son of Francis I, he was dismembered alive by having his limbs tied to horses, which were then driven in four directions. This in Lyon in 1536. The populace, we are told, cut his remains into little morsels, hacked off his nose, tore out his eyes, broke his jaws, trained his head in the mud, and made him die a thousand times before his death. To the laws against crime were added blue laws against recreations, supposedly infringing upon piety, or innovations too abruptly deviating from custom. Fish-eating on Friday, required by common law in Catholic lands, was required by state law in the Protestant England of Edward VI to support the fishing industry, and so train men to the sea for the navy. Gambling was always illegal and always popular. Francis I, who knew how to amuse himself, ordered the arrest of people who played cards or dice in the taverns or gaming houses, this in 1526, but he allowed the establishment of a public lottery in 1539. Drunkenness was seldom punished by law, but idleness was almost a capital crime. Sumptuary laws, designed to check conspicuous expenditure by the newly rich and to preserve class distinctions, regulated dress, adornment, furniture, meals, and hospitality. When I was a boy, said Luther, all games were forbidden, so that card makers, pipers, and actors were not admitted to the sacraments, and those who had played games or been present at shows or plays made it a matter of confession. Most such prohibitions survived the Reformation to reach their peak in the later sixteenth century. It was some consolation that enforcement was rarely as severe as the law. Escape was easy. A kindly, bribed, or intimidated judge or jury let many a rascal go lightly punished or scot-free. Scot originally meant an assessment or fine. The laws of sanctuary were still recognized under Henry VIII. However, laxity of enforcement was balanced by frequent use of torture to elicit confessions or testimony. Here the laws of Henry VIII, though they were the severest in the history of England, were ahead of their time. They forbade torture except where national security was held to be involved. Delay in trying an indicted person could also be torture. One complaint of the Spanish Cortes to Charles V was that men charged with even slight offenses lingered in prison as long as ten years before being tried, and the trials might drag on for twenty years. Lawyers bred and multiplied as the priesthood declined. They filled the judiciary and the higher bureaucracy. They represented the middle classes in the national assemblies and the provincial parlement. Even the aristocracy and the clergy depended on them for guidance in civil law. A new noblesse de robe, the furred cats of Rabelais, formed in France. Canon law disappeared in Protestant countries, and jurisprudence replaced theology as the pièce de résistance in universities. Roman law sprang back to life in Latin countries and captured Germany in the 16th century. Local law survived alongside it in France. Common law was preferred to it in England. But the Justinian Code had some influence in shaping and sustaining the absolutism of Henry VIII. Yet in Henry's own court, his chaplain, Thomas Starkey, composed, circa 1537, a dialogue whose main theme was that laws should dictate the will of the king and that kings should be subject to election and recall. That country cannot long be well governed or maintained with good policy, where all is ruled by the will of one not chosen by election, but cometh to it by natural succession. For seldom seen it is that they which by succession come to kingdoms and realms are worthy of such high authority. What is more repugnant to nature than a whole nation to be governed by the will of a prince? What is more contrary to reason 
than all the whole people to be ruled by him which commonly lacketh all reason. It is not man that can make a wise prince of him that lacketh wit by nature. But this is in man's power, to elect and choose him that is both wise and just, and make him a prince, and him that is a tyrant so to depose. Starkey died a strangely natural death a year after writing this dialogue, but 334 years before it reached print. 3. Morals How did the people of Latin Christendom behave? We must not be misled by their religious professions. These were more often expressions of pugnacity than of piety. The same sturdy men who could believe so fiercely could fiercely blaspheme, and the girls who on Sunday bowed demurely before statues of the Virgin rouged their cheeks hopefully during the week, and many of them got themselves seduced, if only as a proposal of marriage. Virginity had to be protected by every device of custom, morals, law, religion, paternal authority, pedagogy, and point of honor. Yet it managed to get lost. Soldiers returning from campaigns in which sex and liquor had been their chief consolations found it painful to adjust themselves to continence and sobriety. Students majored in venery and protested that fornication was but a venial sin, which enlightened legislators would overlook. Robert Greene declared that at Cambridge he had consumed the flower of my youth amongst wags as lewd as myself. Female dancers, not infrequently, performed on the stage and elsewhere absolutely naked. This apparently is one of the oldest novelties in the world. Artists looked down their noses at the rules and regulations of sexual behavior, and lords and ladies agreed with the artists. Among great folk, wrote Brantome, these rules and scruples concerning virginity are made little of. How many girls I know of the great world who did not take their virginity to the marriage bed? We have noted the sort of story that sweet Marguerite of Navarre seems to have heard without a blush. The bookstalls were stacked with licentious literature, for which high prices were greedily paid. Aretino was as popular in Paris as in Rome. Rabelais, a priest, did not feel that he would reduce the sales of his gargantuan epic by spattering it with such speech as would have made Aretino run to cover. Artists found a ready market for erotic pictures, even for pictured perversions. Masterpieces of this kind were sold by street hawkers, letter carriers, strolling players, even at the great fairs. All the perversions found place in this period, as in the aristocratic pages of Brantome. Prostitution prospered in income and prestige. It was in this age that its practitioners came to be called courtigiane, courtesans, which was the feminine of courtigiani, courtiers. Some generals provided prostitutes for their armies as a safeguard for the other women of occupied towns. But as venereal disease grew almost to the proportions of a plague, Government after government legislated against the unhappy fille de joie. Luther, while affirming the naturalness of sexual desire, labored to reduce prostitution, and under his urging many cities in Lutheran Germany made it illegal. In 1560, Michel de l'Hôpital, Chancellor of France, renewed the laws of Louis IX against the evil, and apparently his decree was enforced. Meanwhile, the absurd lust of flesh for flesh begot the hunger of soul for soul, and all the delicate embroidery of courtship and romantic love. Stolen glances, billets doux, odes and sonnets, lays and madrigals, hopeful gifts and secret trysts poured out of the coursing blood. A few refined spirits, or playful women, welcomed from Italy and Castiglione the pastime of platonic love, by which a lady and her courtier might be passionate friends but sedulously chaste. Such restraint, however, was not in the mood of the age. Men were frankly sensual, and women liked them so. Love poetry abounded, but it was a prelude to possession. Not to marriage. Parents were still too matter-of-fact to let love choose mates for life. Marriage, in their dispensation, was a wedding of estates. Erasmus, sensitive to the charms of women but not of matrimony, advised youngsters to marry as the oldsters wished, and trust to love to grow with association, rather than wither with satiation. And Rabelais agreed with him. Notwithstanding these authorities, a rising number of young people, like Jeanne d'Albray, rebelled against marriages of realty. Roger Ascham, tutor to Elizabeth, mourned that our time is so far from that old discipline and obedience, as now not only young gentlemen, but even very girls, dare marry themselves in spite of father, mother, God, good order, and all. Luther was alarmed to learn that Melanchthon's son had betrothed himself without consulting his father and that a young judge in Wittenberg had declared such a betrothal valid. 
This, the reformer thought, was bound to give Wittenberg a bad name. In the university, he wrote on January 22nd, 1544, We have a great horde of young men from all countries, and the race of girls is getting bold, and run after the fellows into their rooms and chambers and wherever they can, and offer them their free love. And I hear that many parents have ordered their sons home, saying that we hang wives around their necks. The next Sunday I preached a strong sermon, telling men to follow the common road and manner which had been since the beginning of the world, namely that parents should give their children to each other with prudence and goodwill, without their own preliminary engagement. Such engagements are an invention of the abominable Pope, suggested to him by the devil to destroy and tear down the power of parents given and commended to them earnestly by God. Marriage contracts could be arranged for boys and girls as young as three years, but these marriages could be annulled later if not consummated. The legal age for full marriage was generally fourteen for boys, twelve for girls. Sexual relations after betrothal and before the wedding were condoned. Even before betrothal in Sweden and Wales, as later in some American colonies, bundling was allowed. The lovers would lie together in bed but were admonished to keep a sheet between them. In Protestant lands, marriage ceased to be a sacrament, and by 1580, civil marriage was competing with marriage by a clergyman. Luther, Henry VIII, Erasmus, and Pope Clement VII thought bigamy permissible under certain conditions, especially as a substitute for divorce. Protestant divines moved slowly toward allowing divorce, but at first only for adultery. This offense was apparently most prevalent in France, despite the custom of killing adulterous wives. Illicit love affairs were part of the normal life of French women of good social standing. A triangular menage like that of Henry II, Catherine de Médicis, and Diane de Poitiers was quite frequent, the legal wife de Convenance accepting the situation with wry grace, as sometimes in France today. Except in aristocracies, women were goddesses before marriage and servants afterward. Wives took motherhood in their stride, gloried in their numerous children, and managed to manage their managers. They were robust creatures, accustomed to hard work from sunrise to sunset. They made most of the clothing for their families, and sometimes took in work from capitalist entrepreneurs. The loom was an essential part of the home. In England, all unmarried women were spinsters. The women of the French court were a different species, encouraged by Francis I to prettify themselves in flesh and dress, and sometimes turning national policy by the guided missiles of their charms. A feminist movement was imported into France from Italy, but rapidly faded as women perceived that their power and prominence were independent of politics and laws. Many French women of the upper class were well educated. Already in Paris and elsewhere, the French salon was taking form as rich and cultivated ladies made their homes the rendezvous of statesmen, poets, artists, scholars, prelates, and philosophers. Another group of French women, let Anne of France, Anne of Brittany, Claude and René serve as instances, stood quietly virtuous amid the erotic storm. In general, the Reformation, being Teutonic, made for the patriarchal view of woman and the family. It ended her Renaissance enthronement as an exemplar of beauty and a civilizer of man. It condemned the Church's lenience with sexual diversions, and after Luther's death it prepared the way for the Puritanic chill. Social morality declined with the rise of commercialism and the temporary disruption of charity. The natural dishonesty of man found fresh forms and opportunities as a money economy displaced the feudal regime. The newly rich, holding securities rather than land and seldom seeing the individuals from whose labor they benefited, had no traditions of responsibility and generosity such as had gone with landed wealth. Medieval commerce and industry had accepted moral checks in the form of guild, municipal, and ecclesiastical regulations. The new capitalism rejected these restraints and drew men into a strenuous competition that put, pushed aside the old codes. Commercial frauds replaced pious frauds. The pamphlet literature of the age groaned with denunciations of wholesale adulteration of food and other products. The Diet of Innsbruck in 1518 complained that importers add brick dust to ginger and mix unhealthy stuff with their pepper. Luther noted that merchants have learned the trick of placing such spices as pepper, ginger, and saffron in damp vaults to increase their weight. There is not a single article out of which they cannot make profit through false measuring, counting, or weighing, or by producing artificial colors. There is no end to their trickery. The Venetian Senate branded a shipment of English woolens as fraudulent in weight, make, and size. Charity, in the Latin countries, was still administered with medieval cheerfulness. 
Noble families spent a considerable part of their incomes in gifts and alms. Lyon inherited from the 15th century a complex organization of municipal charity to which the citizens gave with open-handed generosity. In Germany and England, the hands were not so open. Luther did his manful best to re-establish the charities interrupted by the princely confiscation of monastic properties, but he confessed that his efforts failed. Under the papacy, he mourned, people were charitable and gave gladly, but now under the dispensation of the gospel nobody gives any longer. Everybody fleeces everybody else. Nobody will give a fennig. Latimer gave a similar report in 1548. London was never so ill as now. In times past, when any rich man died, they would bequeath great sums towards the relief of the poor. Now charity is waxen cold. Two Italian cities, Cardinal Pohl told London, gave more alms than all England. As truth spread, concluded Froude, charity and justice languished in England. Probably it was not Protestantism, but commercialism and unbelief that diminished charity. Pauperism grew to the proportions of a social crisis. Evicted tenants, jobless journeymen, demobilized soldiers, roamed the highways or littered the slums, begging and robbing to live. In Augsburg, the paupers were reckoned at a sixth of the population, in Hamburg a fifth, in London a fourth. O oh, merciful Lord, cried the reformer Thomas Lever, what a number of poor, feeble, halt, blind, lame, sickly, lie and creep in the miry streets. Luther, whose heart was as kind as his tongue was harsh, was among the first to perceive that the state must take over from the church the care and rescue of the destitute. In his address to the Christian nobility of the German nation in 1520, he proposed that every town should provide for its own poor. During his absence in the Wartburg, his radical followers organized in Wittenberg a community fund to care for orphans, dower poor girls, give scholarships to needy students, and lend money to impoverished families. In 1523, Luther drew up a regulation of a common chest, which urged that in each district the citizens and clergy should tax themselves to raise a fund from which loans were to be made, without interest, to persons in need and unable to work. In 1522, Augsburg appointed six Armenpfleger, protectors of the poor, to supervise the distribution of relief. Nuremberg followed suit, then Strasbourg and Breslau in 1523, Radisbon and Magdeburg in 1524. In that year, a Spanish humanist, Juan Luis Vives, wrote for the town council of Bruges a tract on the relief of the poor. He noted the spread of poverty amid growing wealth and warned that the extreme inequality of possessions might engender a ruinous rebellion. As it is disgraceful, he wrote, for the father of a family in his comfortable home to permit anyone in it to suffer the disgrace of being unclothed or in rags, it is similarly unfitting that the magistrates of a city should tolerate a condition in which citizens are hard-pressed by hunger and distress. Vives agreed that all who were capable of work should be made to work, and that no one should be allowed to beg. But since many were really unable to work, some refuge must be set up for them in almshouses, hospitals, and schools financed by the municipality. Food, medical care, and elementary education should be given them gratis, and special provision should be made for the mentally defective. Ypres combined Vives' ideas with the German precedents and organized in 1525 a community chest which united all charitable endowments in one fund and all charitable distribution under one head. Charles V asked for a copy of the Ypres plan and recommended it to all the cities of the empire in 1531, and Henry VIII sent a similar directive to the parishes of England in 1536. In Catholic countries, the church retained the administration of charity. Political morality remained Machiavellian. Spies were taken for granted. Those of Henry VIII and Rome were expected to report the most secret conversations of the Vatican. Bribery was traditional and flowed more lushly after the influx of American gold. Governments competed in violating treaties. Turkish and Christian fleets rivaled each other in piracy. In the decay of chivalry, the morals of war relapsed into semi-barbarism. Cities that had unsuccessfully resisted siege were sacked or burned, Soldiers surrendering were slaughtered or enslaved till ransomed. Such international law and comity as had existed in the occasional submission of kings to arbitration by popes disappeared in a chaos of nationalistic expansion and religious enmity. Toward non-Christians, Christians recognized few moral restraints, and the Turks reciprocated. The Portuguese captured and enslaved African Negroes, and the Spanish conquistadors robbed, enslaved, and killed American natives without abating their high resolve to make the New World Christian. 
Life was so bitter for the American Indians under Spanish rule that thousands of them committed suicide. Even in Christendom there was a startling increase of suicides in this age. Some humanists condoned self-destruction, but the Church ruled that it led straight to hell, so that the successful seeker fell out of the frying pan into the fire. All in all, the Reformation, though it ultimately improved the morals of Europe, temporarily damaged lay morality. Pirkheimer and Hans Sachs, both sympathetic with Luther, mourned that a chaos of unregulated conduct had followed the collapse of ecclesiastical authority. Luther, as usual, was quite frank about the matter. The more we go forward, the worse the world becomes. It is clear enough how much more greedy, cruel, immodest, shameless, wicked the people are now than they were under popery. We Germans are today the laughing stock and disgrace of all peoples. We are regarded as ignominious and obscure swine. We steal, we lie, we eat and drink to excess, and we give ourselves to every vice. It is the general complaint that the young people of today are utterly dissolute and disorderly, and will not let themselves be taught any more. The women and girls of Wittenberg have begun to go bare before and behind, and there is no one to punish or correct them, and God's word is mocked. Andreas Musculus, a Lutheran preacher, described his time, in 1560, as unspeakably immoral compared with the Germans of the 15th century, and many Protestant leaders agreed with him. The future appalls me, moaned Calvin. I dare not think of it. Unless the Lord descends from heaven, barbarism will engulf us. We hear similar notes from Scotland and England. Froude, ardent defender of Henry VIII, summed up fairly, The movement commenced by Henry VIII, judged by its present results, this in 1550, had brought the country at last into the hands of mere adventurers. The people had exchanged a superstition which in its grossest abuses prescribed some shadow of respect and obedience for a superstition which merged obedience in speculative belief. And under that baneful influence, not only the highest virtues of self-sacrifice, but the commonest duties of probity and morality were disappearing. Private life was infected with impurity, to which the licentiousness of the Catholic clergy appeared like innocence. Among the good who remained uninfected, the best were still to be found on the reforming side. We can hardly attribute this moral decline in Germany and England to Luther's unchaining of sex or his scorn of good works, or to Henry's bad example in sexual indulgence and callous cruelty, for a similar, in some ways a more unrestrained license, ruled in Catholic Italy under the Renaissance popes and in Catholic France under Francis I. Probably the basic cause of the moral loosening in Western Europe was the growth of wealth. A main supporting cause was the decline of faith not only in Catholic dogmas but in the very fundamentals of the Christian creed. Nobody cares about either heaven or hell, warned Andreas Musculus. Nobody gives a thought to either God or the devil. In such statements by religious leaders, we must allow for the exaggeration of reformers, disappointed to find how little their theological emendations had improved the moral life. Men had not been much better before, and would not be much better in later centuries, if we may trust the preachers. We can discover all the sins of the sixteenth century in our own age, and all of ours in theirs, according to their means. Meanwhile, both Catholicism and Protestantism had set up and strengthened two focuses of moral regeneration the improvement of clerical conduct through marriage or continence, and the emphasis on the home as the final citadel of faith and decency. In the long run, the Reformation would really reform, even to excess, and the time would come when men and women would look back with secret envy to that sixteenth century when their ancestors had been so wicked and so free. 4. Manners People, then, as now, were judged more by their manners than by their morals. The world forgave more readily the sins that were committed with the least vulgarity and the greatest grace. Here, as in everything but artillery and theology, Italy led the way. Compared with the Italians, the people north of the Alps, except for a thin upper crust in France and England, were fairly uncouth. The Italians called them barbarians, and many Frenchmen, charmed with their Italian conquests in field and chamber, agreed with them. But the barbarians were eager to be civilized. French courtiers and courtesans, poets and poisoners, followed Italian models, and the English limped sedulously behind. Castiglione's courtier of 1528 was translated into French in 1537, into English in 1561, and polite circles debated the definition of a gentleman. Manuals of manners were bestsellers. Erasmus composed one. Conversation became an art in France, as later in the Mermaid Tavern in London. The duel of repartee crossed the Alps from Italy about the same time as the art of fencing. 
Conversation was more polished in France than in Germany. The Germans crushed a man with humor. The French punctured him with wit. Freedom in speech was the vital medium of the age. Since the surface can be more easily made presentable than the soul, the rising classes and the rising civilizations of the North paid much attention to their clothing. Commoners dressed artlessly enough, as we see in Bruegel's multitudes, cup-like hats, loose blouses with bulging sleeves, tight trousers reaching down to comfortable shoes, with the ungainly composition centering upon a codpiece, an insolent bag, sometimes brightly ornamented, dangling before the male crotch. Moneyed males in Germany enveloped their mighty frames in voluminous folds of cloth, topped with broad hats that lay on the head like terraced pancakes. But German women were apparently forbidden to dress otherwise than as hausfrauen or cooks. In England, too, the men wore more finery than their ladies until Elizabeth outshone them with her thousand dresses. Henry VIII set a pace in extravagance of costume, prettifying his pounds with color and ornaments and precious stuffs. The Duke of Buckingham, at the marriage of Prince Arthur to Catherine of Aragon, wore a gown wrought of needlework, says Hollinshead, furred with sables and valued at fifteen hundred pounds, or about a hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Sumptuary laws forbade any man lower than a knight to ape the sartorial splendor of his betters. English women covered their forms tightly, with dresses reaching from neck to floor and sleeves to the wrist, with a trimming of fur at edges, and broad girdles buckled with metal ornaments and carrying a pendant or a rosary. In general, they wore less jewelry than the men. Under the appreciative Francis I, French women opened their bodices, displayed swelling bosoms, and cut their gowns in the back almost to the last vertebra. If the natural bust swelled inadequately, an artificial bust was inserted under the stays. Clothing was tightened under the breasts and pinched at the waist. Sleeves billowed, hidden wires spread out the skirt at rear and hem, and high-heeled shoes compelled a prancing, airy step. Women of rank, no others, were allowed to wear a train or tail to their dresses, the nobler the longer. If nobility sufficed, it might be seven yards long, and a maid or page would follow to hold it up. In another style, the woman would cover her neck with a frez, or ruff, stiffly supported by wires, and men in a formal mood pilloried themselves in like contraptions. About 1535, Servetus noted that the women of Spain have a custom that would be held barbarous in France of piercing their ears and hanging gold rings in them, often set with precious stones. But by 1550, earrings were worn by the ladies of France and even by men. Jewelry continued its immemorial sway. Frenchmen clothed themselves in silk shirts and velvet doublets, padded their shoulders, cased their legs in tight-colored breeches, and protected their manhood with a braguette or codpiece, sometimes set off with ribbons or jewelry. Reversing the custom of the fifteenth century, they wore their hair short and their beards long. Feminine hair was worn in a variety of structures, discouraging to describe. It was braided, curled, netted, filled out with switches, decked with flowers, brightened with gems, perfumed with unguents, dyed to match the fashion, and raised in towers or pyramids above the head. Hairdressers were now indispensable to women of fashion, for growing old seemed a fate worse than death. How clean were the bodies behind the frills? This book is continued on Cassette 5, Side 1.